morning and welcome to Issues and Society, a program that discusses trending issues that is affect our day-to-day -day living. I am Zainab Obiti. Following observations of Nigerians that power supply does not match the demand, constant and reliable electricity supply is critical to the growth of the Nigerian economy. It is a known fact that electricity generally in Nigeria is inadequate, unavailable in most rural communities, and unreliable where available. So in consideration with our special report on the power sector, today our focus shall be on Yola Electricity Distribution Company. And my guest is the charismatic managing director of Yola Electricity Distribution Company in person of Dr. Umar Abubakar. Hush it. Don't go away. With an ever-evolving society, there are everyday issues in the marketplace, in government, in our social lives, even in our homes. Issues and Society brings these happenings to you. Join us on this station for sponsorship and advert placement. Please call 081 one zero 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 seven one two or better still follow us on our social media handles hello thanks for joining us this is issues in society and my name is zena Bubiti. in continuation of our specialty the discourse on the power sector with me on the program today is the managing director and chief executive of Yola Distribution Company, right? and it is the person of uh, Dr. Omar Abubakar Hashi. So you're welcome on the program. Thank you, ma'am. Can you Thank give you. us a brief background of the Yola Electricity Distribution Company? Um, thank you, Zainab, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on your program. Um, Yola Electricity Distribution Company as you know, is one of the successor distribution companies from the defunct um, power holding company of Nigeria. Um, we are one of the 11, and um, we cover Adamawa State, Borno State, Taraba State, and Yobe State. So we have four states under our jurisdiction, or what we call our license area. Uh, we cover a landmass spanning about 207,000 square kilometers. So by landmass, we are the largest disco in Nigeria. Uh, yes. So the nearest disco that is close to us in terms of size is Kaduna Disco, which is 148 million um, thousand square kilometers. So the gap is huge in terms of our landmass. We serve roughly a population of about 16.5 to about 17 million customers. That's the total population of these four states. Um, on our customer database, we have just under 400,000 customers. And this is what we are. And in terms of our injection capacity or the energy uptake, uh, YEDC, as you know, we call YOLA, takes up about 3.5% of the total generation in the country. So that is our, you know, MITO allocation. Um, but um, over the years, I mean, the offtake from YEDC has been hovering between 2.8 to about 3% of the total generation within the, con uh, you know, um, the country. Uh, so that is that in terms of that. Um, uh, we have a very, you know, uh, good staff strength and then we were here like we always say we're here to serve and we took over YEDC and on the 1st of January 2022. What do I mean by we took over? If you look at it, the privatization happened in on the 1st of November 2013. However, the previous investors declared a force majeure on YEDC due to you know the insurgency and what has been going on around um, you know, some of the licensed area around Meduguri, Yobe, and as well even some part of Adama State. So the disco was handed back over to the government. After a while, a new privatization exercise was done. It was culminated last year, and we took over on the 1st of January. 
Uh, as you know, um, it's been challenging and rewarding, if I might say, concurrently. Why do I say it's been challenging and rewarding? Uh, it's that um, we cover an area which security is still an issue, partly. Uh, we cover an area where within our network, we do not have seamless access to the network. What do I mean by we do not have seamless access to the network? Technically, I should be able to, from here now, go to a movie and go around to Maiduguri within the network, and I should be in Maiduguri in roughly three hours. But right now, it's almost virtually impossible. Chances are we'll have to fly from here to Abuja, then you fly from Abuja to Maiduguri. So that's one. There are areas in between. So there's peace in Maiduguri, but there are areas in between Yes, exactly. Accessibility is an issue. Uh, being the fact that um, it was a disco that was privatized, re, you know, I wouldn't say renationalized, but you know, taken over by the government, some of the efficiency gains that the other sectors, uh, other discos have had over the last nine years, some of it was a bit truncated in Yola, if I may say. So by us taking over meant. Um, Obviously, we are starting from, a, yeah, probably you said scratch, but at least the pedestal where we are, it's a bit lower than where some of the others are. That's one. Number two, there's the security challenge. Number three, we have another issue, which is the lack of power in the biggest market that we have, which is Maiduguri. So if you do recall, um, TCN or the Transmission Company of Nigeria has declared a force majeure on the line supplying Maiduguri. So the 330 KV line from Damatu to Maiduguri was vandalized by you know the insurgents. So Maiduguri has been out of supply practically for now, if I may say, close to two years. Thank you so much. We are from Paz. You talked about peace has been restored. I was going to ask you that, say, despite the insurgency, the kidnapping, how are people going to be able to you know, survive in this uh, in especially? To say honestly, people are resilient, fair enough, you know, and it's 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 quite interesting, you know, when you're over there or someplace in Nigeria when you hear Adama or Yobi, the thing that comes to mind is people are really scared and think, Oh my god. But then when you come down and you're in Yola now and from you you flew in the airport and you, I think when you're coming, you're thinking, oh my God, I'm coming to Yola. And now you're, th you're like, oh. <laughs> so all my fears of, it's usually like that. So the resilience in the people, as well as, yes, though there's this challenge. So sometimes within, you know, the metropolitan areas, within certain places, life is 100% normal. You don't even see anything or you don't hear or you don't think of it. But there are still areas where, you know, accessibility is an issue. So those are kind of things. So simple things, linkages are becoming difficult. So you'll see somebody wants to go from here to Yobe. Naturally, you just go through Shani and got across and go through B1. But do people still ply those roads? The question is, are you willing to risk it? Are you willing to risk the staff? Are you willing to? So those are the kind of questions you're faced with. So you still see a, you know, a day's journey or a few hours journey will take you a day or two days. So this hampers our efficiency. There are times when we are going out on a patrol. So for example, when the feeder trips, the 33 KV from Babangida feeder that goes from, what do you call it, Damatu to Meduguri. If it trips, you need uh, military escorts for our staff to be able to go and patrol the line to see where the fault is and rectify that. That's one. Uh, there are places where when things like this happen or out of the blue, there are vandalization on the line, maybe some insurgency across some part and someone decides to take a pot shot at the insulators or we just, just come and see that um, three, four, seven poles are down, damaged. 
and you still have to do that. So there are still those issues around the security. So these are, you know, you have a feeder that is so lengthy and as soon as, so you can patrol from maybe eight, nine in the morning to maybe two. You have to, you wouldn't want, um, what do you call it, dusk to meet you in an unexpected place. So, exactly. So these are some of the challenges. So something that we could you know, do, so if I want to, something happens now, is 12.30. We'll have to probably be tomorrow, because for you to be able to arrange the security and everything, and then you barely have two hours or three hours, you know, it's difficult. So you plan ahead as early as tomorrow so that you'll be able to have, you know, good daylight hours and time to be able. So those are the challenges. I mean, but um, someone has to do it. Power is essential. There are communities here. People are still living here. So. You tell me about uh, the tenant. What is that? It's down here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So electricity theft is, uh, comes in multiples of ways. So there is what we call, you know, you know, in the, in the parlance of the industry when, you know, people go on and say, you know, HEC and C losses. What it means is, is the aggregate, technical, commercial and collection losses. And I'll explain to you. Obviously, first and foremost, electricity is, flows as a potential. So is, you know, to go technical is the electrons flow in. So as the electrons flows through the conductor, it gets heated up. And some of those energies are dissipated as heat. So that's what you call the technical losses. You lose some of it through, you know, the technical, you know. And when you are stepping power down from, let's say, 33 kV to 11 kV, you have transformer losses, you have copper losses, you know. And then as you before it gets to the people. So probably you still have those losses ranging from you know three, four, seven to eight to ten percent. So that's the you know, technical loss. So you, these are part and parcel of the network. Because well, the more stable, the better, the more your network is, the more uh what do you call it, less aged uh what do you call it, uh equipments you have, the better, obviously the more you adhere to the standards and codes in terms of having the right sizes of conductors or fuses, the less those technical losses would be. So that is from the technical side. And then when you talk about electricity, then there's the commercial side. These are people that take electricity, take power, and they are not even on our database. So you don't even build them. So it's someone that has you know, let's say a uh, building now, outside is uncompleted, but he will drag a line or bury it and still has electricity. So, you, you know, you become, okay, there's no electricity connection. So technically, all oh, the house is uncompleted, but hey, they have a line there and they're still getting that electricity. So that is theft. But that is even worse because it's a commercial time. You don't even know it's there. Then there is the collection where people really or people consume the electricity, they admit it's been consumed, but they don't pay for it. So I wouldn't call that, I, I wouldn't say it was theft, but maybe lack of payment. And there's the other side of the theft where they willfully bypass their meters or have a line that goes in. So you have a three phase meter. Naturally, the line will come through the primary side into the meter and output so that the meter records it and, you know, you pay for what you're consuming. And you see people drawing another line that doesn't go through the meter. So that's theft. And then there's one that, um, you know, they compromise the meter. Either instead of all the three phases being read, you have one of the phases or two. You know, things like that. So those are the kind of things that we've been battling with. Honestly, I know it's so rampant all across. We've been metering people. And but at the same time, sometimes it's very bad that the day you meet her will be the day someone or the next day tampers with that meter either through connivance either through having people locally do it having even maybe organized syndicates now that people literally have you know organized syndicates that you know go to communities and say you know we can adjust your meter or we can do something to make your meter not run 
you know, fast or whatever they call it. And you know, these are coming from the people working with you or people outside who just do that by themselves. So um, you, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out um, people working with us. Honestly, I'm, I'm not saying that. You know, there are bad eggs and bad apples all across. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been trying as much as possible to curb that ex- but whatever it is, it needs the connivance of both parties. So if I was a customer and the YEDC staff comes and says, Oh, I'm going to make you do this. If you don't cooperate with him and say, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. Oh, let me see your ID, which is here. I'm going to report you. Obviously that. But I think one of the reason uh, 30 to 40 percent of people who want to do that is because of this um, estimated uh, uh, reading. Billing. That's so huge. Funny enough, funny enough, I'll, I'll tell you this. It's If it was estimated billing, in fact, us, the problem now is the other way around. We want to meet our people. And people are running away from being metered. They would rather get estimated bills because they know their consumption is way above what we've been doing. So there's been a regulation called the uh, capping order by you know the regulator NAC. Right? And what this, the capping order is saying, okay, uh, if you are not metered and you are on a certain feeder that has a certain hours of supply and they monitor this, you should not be estimated above a certain cap which we are adhering to. So if, for example, you are in Zumeta and the cap for, and the, the regula- uh, regulator send issues out that cap every month, depending on the changes in the dynamics of you know, the supply, and as well as, you know, the numbers of metered customers and they monitor the consumption pattern of that. If that is going up, I mean, the, you know, the uh, cap is adjusted accordingly. You find out people know that Wow, I'm consuming a lot more. I don't have to regulate my electricity. I can put on my AC all day, especially here in New Orleans, Midwest. Sometimes during the rain, the seasons it gets unbearably hot. You know, temperatures reach, away. and you know that you will need that. And if you do that, you know these equipments take up a lot. People don't want to be metered, or as soon as you meet up people, for you know we have that challenge here. You know, there was the national mass metering program and the phase zero and the phase one is coming up, and we are trying to aggressively meet up people. And some places people are resisting. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yes, Honestly. it's um, over uh, 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 so three or four years now that this uh, paid meter has been out. But yet, it's not uh, going around. So many people still desire to have it, but it's not upcoming. What's the thing? Okay, so. Um, over the years, to look at it, there have been different phases and different projects that have been that have gone on in terms of this. So, what do I see? Different projects. Uh, there was the Capney introduced so that you know people could buy. Then there was the meter asset provider, and obviously now the meter asset provider, as well as concurrently the national mass metering program. And I think the phase, phase zero, and then we're moving on to the phase one. And I think quite a number of, in, in that time, the last NMMP, I think a um, substantial number of meters have been deployed all across the country. I, uh, I think it's, the numbers should be above a million meters. The metering gap in the country is about, I think, between four to five million. So there's still a huge gap. And then and the phase one will close the gap. Obviously, there's another phase two. And, you know, so these are challenges within the sector. We understand that. Understand customers want it. We understand that there are issues with liquidity and all of that in terms of procuring these meters and making them available. So that I think that's where the government through the central bank has stepped in to ensure that these are loans are being given for this special purpose for us to be able to do that. I think I'm... Um, you know, people can argue that maybe the pace at which we are rolling out is not, you know, very fast. But at the same time, I think um, things have been done in terms of that. So, okay, would you want to tell us about the uniqueness of the uh, YEC for your service delivery? Yeah, I mean, so I would say, you know, in terms of service delivery, I think. If we look at where we were, where, where, where we took over to where we are today, I think um, we've done a lot. We've done a lot in terms of 
customer service. We've done a lot in terms of engaging with the customers. We've done a lot in actually making sure that customers have seamless ability to pay. So, you know, people can now pay online, people can view their bill, you know, individually, you can just go onto the website, click on, go onto the business system and, say, and, and buy. You can download our app directly from, you know, uh, the Google Play Store, the iOS is coming up as well. And literally within the comfort of your room, pay for your post postpaid and buy your token prepaid. These are things we've done. I mean, People can come in, walk in, give us a call. We've extended our opening hours within the key metropolitan areas at some point to live in 10, 30, 11 at night so that people will be able to come. Oh, I really want to share with us one of some of your musicians' achievements since you took over. Oh, yeah. So now one of your key achievements, I mean, now we've instituted you know, performance management and tracking. We've done a lot in terms of making sure we have a... a, a good billing system now that is modern that is that allows you to do performance monitoring tracking and is as accurate as you can get within the sector and so on of the industry flagship and standard um we've been able to have good uh teams you know uh, one of the thing is when you come in late into the market you're able to see some of the pitfalls of you know some of the discos and you're able to get talent from you and the team one of the key things is the people that we have honestly young dynamic i mean everybody working together at the same purpose to ensure that our vision and our mission are achieved which is ensuring stable power supply to this area and making sure and i can go on and on in terms of trainings that we've been doing in terms of engagement with the customer in terms of even the community outreach that we've been doing on all of this are all geared towards improving efficiency all geared towards making sure that as a disco we are doing the right thing both on our core obligation, which is supplying power, but at the same time, making sure that as a, you know, as a good community member, we are doing the right thing. You already uh, you shared a little about some of your challenges in the one at North Park State. So now, would you to the specific time, what are the challenges? You know, it's not always available. Mm. Challenges, obviously, there's the security. Yeah, so you, 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 I don't want to keep you know harping on it, but it's not only here now. The security challenges and other discords. You know, formerly it was mainly domiciled and local to YEDC per se, but now there are other places. So, but we just don't want to keep dwelling on it. But it's there. We know uh, when we bought the disco, we knew it was there. So, yeah, you know, we are mindful of that. But you know. We have to work within that and env the environment we find ourselves in. So we're doing that. And there's also the challenge of the dilapidated network we inherited and how much investment is required, which, you know, the, we are not shying away. And thankfully, there are other intervention funds that are available, you know, either through, you know, the Nigeria Electricity Market Stabilization Fund from the CBN and other things, as well as some of the World Bank projects that are going to come up to stream. You know. So those are the things that we are looking forward to that will be able to help us transform the disco, as well as our core investors have really invested huge amounts of money and they're still investing. And that is part of what they've, you know, wanted to do anyway, ever since. And, and we hope this will yield results. They've been started yielding results since we started. And, and we're not relenting. We know that, I mean, all this can be pushed back by, you know, a serious breach to the security. But we are hopeful that, you know, we're over that level that we were, you know, in the last, you know, couple of years when things were really, really difficult and things were really bad. But um, we're hopeful. Yes, we interview to an end. I want you to tell us briefly about yourself. Oh, um, I'm Omar. You've seen me here. Uh, I work for Yola Electricity. I have the privilege of serving as the MD currently. And prior to that, I've worked in the uh, other private sector organization, other discords. I've more worked with the multilateral agencies, both uh, in here in the country and outside. I've worked as a tutor and, you know, uh as well and so the, that's my background my background spans you know consultancy the power sector 
and as well as financial management and advisory. And um, uh, I think probably that's what I can say about myself here yeah, and um, working with the team and making sure that uh, we build a resilient disco, we build a disco that is the envy of others in the industry and we're trying to get to that position and that point. Uh, from uh, why you see power and the corporate world, how do you rest? How do you unwind? Uh, I, I play sports. One, I play football, I play basketball. I'm quite good at both and I can say that confidently. Uh, and then uh, I love watching sports as well. And then I uh, do horse riding. My kids are crazy. I know my kids are crazy about horse riding. So when I'm home over the weekend, usually we try and do that. And, you know, when you have family, they keep you grounded, especially when you have young kids. So we do that. And I have a lot of hobbies and I read as well. So Yeah, I would like to say a very big thank you for looking outside for this interview. We really do appreciate it. Please join us again. We're going to continue to be absolutely special. Give honor to whom honor is due. Who deserves the honor for Giant Strides Achievers Merit Award? Awardees categories include Giant Strides Achievers Personality in Leadership and National Development, Giant Strides Achievers Institutions in Research, Innovation and Infrastructural Development. 42 nominees, only 15 winners shall emerge. Who deserves the award? Send your votes for your preferred institutions or personalities via our website at www.soulmediacommunication.com forward slash GC awards or call 0812-409-5510, 0818-708-2257 or 0706-566-5298. Giant Strides Achievers Merit Award, promoting good leadership, recognizing good work. Welcome back. But this is where we draw the curtain for today's episode. Should you miss today's broadcast, you can follow us on our social media handle. I remain Zainab Obeyton. Thanks for watching. See you next week.